we ran go mod tidy, and the first thing that we see the tooling say is finding module for package. So what's going on there? Well, if we go back to our Go environment here, there is a, another very important environment variable called Go proxy. Now, if you look at the default settings for Go proxy, it points with a protocol to a server that's sitting there inside of Google, and then it has comma, and then it says direct. So the Go team runs a service somewhere in GCP, and it goes by two names. It's either the proxy server or the module mirror. Why there's two names, I have no idea. But the Go environment variable says proxy. So there's the proxy server. Now, the job of the proxy server is to maintain two things. To maintain a record of all known public modules and their versions, and keep a copy of all the source code related to that. So what happened here in our app is when I ran go mod tidy, all we knew on the import was that I wanted github.com artandlabs conf. So by default, a request came here and it said, give me a list of all versions that you know for artandlabs conf. So give me a list. In fact, if I switch over to the original uh, repo, which I don't have here right now, huh? I don't want to bring that up just yet. Um, make fun. Just so you can kind of see it here. Essentially, this is the call that was made. There it is. So the Go tooling made that call. Said, give me a list of all the versions um, right now for that Arden Labs conf. And then it said, fine, here's your list. And then the Go tooling looked at that list and said, okay, this is a direct dependency. So which version here is the latest, sort of greatest? And we see that 150 is the latest, greatest. So at that point, it said, okay, brilliant. Um, do me a favor, give me conf at version 150. And then what got returned was a zip file for conf at that 150. So a zip file comes, comes back over. And then that zip file, if we come back here, We come back here. That zip file then is extracted and all this got created in the, in the Go module cache. So we're gonna go ahead here and un we're gonna go to the, the mod cache here. We're gonna unzip all the source code out of that, that file. And then we wanna go ahead and then write to go.mod we write to go.mod that we got that version. And we see that in the project, boom. Now, there's actually more that's also happening here. It also then went and looked at the go.mod file for conf, noticed that there was potentially some other dependencies and started downloading those in the mod cache as well. And if any of those dependencies had a go.mod file, it would just continue to traverse all of those go.mod files, downloading everything that, uh, you know, that, that, that's there. But even there, there's still more. Let's imagine that this is all we did. Let's imagine this is where we stop. We got a go.mod file that has a version, we can ask the proxy server for that code, and we can always get it. 
and that's fine. But what's happening here? We're asking Google for something. Now, that network request comes with some private information. One of those things being our IP address. So Go has a privacy policy that says that, yes, it's going to know your IP address, and then it's going to know it for 30 days. And all it's going to do with that information is potentially aggregate it. But no worries, we're not going to do anything beyond that. I'm OK with it. I mean, what do I care? They, they saw what IP address I have from some ISP this month, right? Like, it doesn't mean anything to me. But some companies get a little jitter, you know, like they're a little like jittery. They're like, oh, I don't want Google knowing what I'm doing. So there's some choices here that you can make from an engineering perspective if you don't want Google knowing what's going on. Remember when we did the Go ENV for Go Proxy, there was a comma direct. So we could do a couple things. I could change Go Proxy and get rid of that and just keep direct. Now, what does that mean? It means that I'm telling the Go tooling, don't go to that proxy server anymore. Go to GitHub directly and redirect you know, these different calls that we're going to have. Do it a little differently, but ask GitHub what the versions are and then basically pull those files off of GitHub directly and write this to the mod file and put them there. So essentially do this. Now, that's fine, but honestly, a couple of things here. It's going to be slower because this stuff isn't already compressed in a zip file. You have to do this like when you're cloning. You got to get one file at a time and bring them down. Uh, IP can restrict accessibility. Download of a repo from my findings. IP can restrict accessibility. I'm not sure what you're asking there, Gary, but let me keep going and then I'll get back to you on that. So I could go direct. Now, ideally, we could do that. It's going to be slower. Maybe I don't care. But this is where things can start to get interesting. So the first time I decided to pull down this code, let's say I went to the proxy server. No big deal. There it is. Now, I, now I'm in a different environment. Let's say that I'm in some sort of uh, CI, CD environment. Okay? And I'm going to build. And I decide here that I'm going to go direct. If I go direct, what are the chances that when I ask for version 1.5 of comp directly from GitHub, that I get the same exact code back? What are the chances? They're pretty good, but they're not absolute, are they? 80%. I would say that we have no clue. And we have no idea even if the code isn't different. Why? Because, look, what is stopping me, since I own this repo, to go in here and delete the 150 tag, update the code, put it up, and then reapply 1.5 to it? Nothing is stopping me from doing that. So that tag isn't necessarily a guarantee that the code is always the same. And since I know that you're using it, I slipped in some really nasty bugs, or I broke the API, or I added a security risk. And now you're downloading that code, and you're building against it. So as Tyler is saying, we need a way of knowing that we're always using the exact code that we saw the very first time. This is where the Go go.sum file comes in. So after we downloaded this code, a couple things happened. The Go tooling went ahead and generated a hash 
for all of the code, and then it generated a hash for go.mod using whatever hashing algorithm that it uses. Then it decided, let me check these hash codes with the go.sum file, except what? We didn't have a go.sum file yet, did we? So, since this is the first time we're seeing this code, what now happens is another set of requests go to another server, I'll paint it in blue, called the checksum db. This is a second service that runs in Google. And what happened, since this is the first time we saw the code, our tooling went to the checksum db and said, what hash codes do you have? And then we compared our hash codes with those hash codes. Now, if you're only ever going to the proxy server, that should always be the same. But if we start going direct, now this checksum is super important because we can also say, did the hash codes match? Now, ideally, by the time we get into CI, CD, we've already written them out to go.sum, and we don't have to go hit the checksum database anymore. This becomes the hash code of truth. And so ideally, this didn't really go back to the checksum DB. This just checked it against go.sum and said, yes, this is the same exact code we expect that we downloaded. So this go sum file is critically important because it gives you that durability that you're always using the same exact code bit by bit that you downloaded the very first time. And so now it doesn't matter where we go get it from. For the full course, visit courses.ardenlabs.com.